recording in progress. And without further ado, I will never do the justice of properly uh, introducing Don to uh, our audience. So Don, I'm gonna take it away, uh, have you tell everybody about a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm retired. I've retired five times. Um, <laughs> so actually, I'm a failure at retirement. Um, but what retirement allows me to do is basically to do what I want to do without reporting to anybody. And what I did this time. Ah, siempre dice eso. En tu página web lo dice varias veces. Yo estoy retirado y pues eso me hace hacer lo que yo quiera. Somebody has to mute their microphone. Okay. Um, so what I did this time was I thought about my career where I've started off as an engineer and then was a psychologist, then an industry executive, a cognitive scientist, and now a designer. And uh, the books that I've written in design are all about making things easier to use and easier to understand. And I think that's been very useful and helpful, but it doesn't change the world and the world needs help. And so I spent the last few years thinking about that, learning about it, talking to many people, traveling, not too much traveling because COVID got in the way and uh, ended up with this book called Design for a Better World, which has to be meaningful, sustainable and humanity centered. And some of you will say, well, what happened to human centered? And the issue is this, that human-centered is the old-fashioned way of design. It's a design that's been with us for a long time. Namely, it's designed as a tool of industry to allow it to sell more, make more profits, make more money, higher margins, make things attractive. But design isn't about making it attractive. And design shouldn't be about making companies richer. I mean, that's not a bad idea, and it's good if you're in a company, uh, but not necessarily obscene richness, and not at the price of degrading the environment and moreover uh, devaluing the differences among cultures. And so I decided I would write about that, but I would focus only on the things that I really thought I had some understanding and had maybe a slightly different point of view. So I talked about the fact that, you know, most of the world was designed, not by designers, but by people. The notion of a country, that's an artificial concept. The notion of laws, that's artificial. The notion of, well, even how you eat, <laughs> the table etiquette, that's artificial. Uh, almost everything is artificial. And basically, when we're born and we live in a society for our formative years, the way that society works seems natural. It never occurs to people that's unnatural, and that there might be other societies that do things very, very differently. Well, today we've reached a point where unfortunately we're being ruled by uh, economic systems that are completely irrational. They claim they're very logical, uh, and they, but they don't, they're developed by people who don't understand people. They measure everything, whether, including your happiness and how much you're worth if you get your arm broken or you die. In terms of money, money, money isn't everything. Money is some weird, arbitrary concept that the economists love. And they believe in measuring everything, including things they can't measure. So uh, that's what I went after. We have to measure things that are meaningful to people like comfort, happiness, enjoyment. Are you, do you feel like you are in control of your life? We have to uh, make things that are sustainable. We shouldn't be creating projects that destroy the earth and mining to get the wonderful materials to make these nice, thin, clever devices. Uh, we shouldn't have devices that are destroy the earth when they're manufactured, destroy the earth when they're used, destroy the earth when they're disposed of. And finally, we have to change by thinking about the implications of everything that we're doing to the world. Hence, the transformation of human-centered design, which the principles I think are very important and still valid, but they're not broad enough. And so to me, humanity-centered design is human-centered design expanded, expanded to think about the worldwide implications, the way that we're destroying the environment, the way that we have destroyed cultures, the different ways of living, trying to make it all homogeneous, all the Western way. That isn't necessary. And in fact, it's losing great value when we do that. So that's what this book is about. 
Now, I don't give talks anymore. I decided that giving a talk, uh, I never know if this is the right talk for the audience. And I also realized that the question period for many people was much more interesting than the talk. And so over time, I started making my talk shorter and the question period longer until I've reached the current state where it's no talk, all questions. And so I've been carefully instructed Jan, Jen and Adam uh, about how this <laughs> is going to work. And you can look it on, it's on my website, instructions for doing a discussion section. And so I'm governed by what you ask for or what you care about. So I turn it back to Jen and Adam. Great, thanks for that, Don. So um, why this book now? You've written a lot of influential books. I think a lot of us here on this call, I've read a lot of your books. Why this book now? I just thought I said that. I said, I sat back and said, okay, so mm -hmm. what's, I'm 87 years old. I don't know how many more books I have left in me. And this one I want to make to, to be different. And moreover, as, as the issues that I started facing in the world and reading about and experiencing myself, and I've traveled a lot to a lot of the countries that have been badly impacted by what's happening today. I was in the Ukraine not that long ago before the war. Uh, I've been to uh, several different areas in Africa, a large number of places in, in India. Um, I'm a professor in Shanghai, um, and I'm on the advisory board in Hong Kong, and I've seen all sorts of things from, from wealth to poverty, uh, to very luxurious places, to places that are horrible, and quite often next door to one another, not necessarily in different countries. And moreover, every country has this. The United States has horrible poverty and horrible wealthy, wealthiness. So that's why I did the book. And actually, I want to make a point that it's interesting that as my book came out, a whole bunch of other books came out saying almost the same thing. In fact, uh, I was sent a book. Uh, and as I was reading it, I said to my wife, I'm reading my book except it was written by somebody else. It was written by that guy right there, Bob Cosman. <laughs> and uh, your book just got published or is about to be published, but it's right around now. You're muted. I don't know if he can unmute himself. Can I am you? trying. Let's there see. Go. There we Hi. go. Uh, yeah, it just uh, it surprised me because it wasn't supposed to come out until uh, next week, but it came out uh, last week. So um, thanks, Don. I really appreciate you mentioning it, and I, I really appreciate your support. Um, uh, you, I've, I've read your books from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There are, I have the entire collection. Uh, and uh, so to, uh, to have your support is, is uh, really very meaningful uh, for me. And, uh, and I appreciate that very much. But what I thought was very positive was not just Bob's book, which I really loved. And it's, it's, it's written with the same underlying philosophy that's in my book, except he has many more case stories, many more. Uh, so it, it's, I claim that you really need to read both books. I set a larger framework and he, he fills it in with what is the, the details that you need to know. And, but it means that other people are thinking the same thing. It means I'm not exactly yep. thinking something crazy. And we've actually found many more people who are doing this about now too. So it's just not even the two of us, it's more. But let me turn it over to the rest of the audience and the questions that you might have or things you wanna talk about. Sure, thanks for that. Um, Adam, I think you pulled a question. Yeah, yeah, Don, you, you sort of touched on right at the beginning that term artificial and artificiality. I'd, I'd really love to go into that in a little bit more detail and sort of talk about that with the audience in terms of what that means and how that means as designers and how we respond. Um, everything was designed. And as I said, uh, designed not by, by people or professional designers, but the creation of a constitution is a design. And uh, there are many constitutions around the world and the creation of laws are really, um, I, we have some problem that we see and we try to overcome it by uh, some law. And, um, and, but that's a design process. So everything is designed. And as I, as it sort of happened as I was sitting here 
right where I am right now, and I'm looking out the window, and I really am. If I look out the window, I'm at a sort of a of about 200 feet up, which is what uh, 100 100 some odd meters, a little bit less, 90 meters, and um, I can see. The city of San Diego, which is obviously artificial. I can see Mission Bay, which is a wonderful recreation area of water. I can see the Pacific Ocean. I can see the mountains of Mexico. Uh, I can see palm trees, uh, cable, telephone wires, electric power wires. But you know, everything is artificial. Mexico, that's artificial. The boundary between Mexico and the United States is artificial. It was fought over for a long time. And um, the the Mission Bay was actually a swamp and was reconstructed to be a recreational area. And yes, I see birds and we have coyotes and we have hawks and we have hummingbirds and we have all sorts of wonderful animals here. But um, this used to be a steep hill. And in order to put a house here, they had to level it off and put roads in and so on. And so this whole environment here was planted, it's artificial. And so the habitat that allows the animals to live here is artificial. And so uh, that really made me think a lot about the role of artificiality and the fact that when you're born in some place, you come to take that for granted. And you think, well, we can't change it. Well, actually, the hardest thing to change is human behavior, but we have changed it. It may take 100 years. So the notion that women were not allowed to vote because women were not equal, that took how many years before women were given the right to vote? You could say it isn't done yet because not every place uh, treat women equally yet. But it took roughly 100 years in the United States. Um, you could argue it even took longer because when does it start? Well, it started when women started complaining and asking for the equal rights. And then it took 100 years. And so we can do things if we gather together, including changing people's firm beliefs about what, how life should be lived. Uh, look at what's happening in the notion of gender and sex in the recent 10 years. Uh, that was very difficult to overcome and still is not overdone, not finished. But we can change everything. We can change the economic models that say that a company owns its, owes its uh, obligations to its shareholders and not to its employees or to its customers or to the environment where it's located. That's nonsense. And a lot of people are saying that now and it's starting to change and we're starting to teach MBA students that this is not the way to run a company. So it will take a while. And are, this, are these done by professional designers? No, but if you look at the professional design, we have a way of approaching a problem that's unique. What's, it's, it's called design thinking by designers, but not, not the kind of design thinking that you get when you take a one week course and it's all fun and create, creative and so on. That's good and nice, but actually it usually leads nowhere because the hard part is making something that can actually be done. And the hardest part is actually doing it. So design doing is the most important part. And that's what we have to do. And designers today are mostly in the middle levels of companies or even universities and don't have much say. Most of you, if you work in a company, you have no choice about the, comp the products that you are devising. You are told what to do by your company or by your client. We wanna change that. Get designers in position of influence, designers who are CEOs of large companies, designers who are chief design officers of large companies, designers who can take these considerations, but, to do that, you have to earn it. So the way you move up in a company or even at a university is by having a broader point of view, not just your specialty. Sure, you're a great designer, but that doesn't mean you can run a company. So you have to show that you understand all the other divisions of the company, what they do, and realize it's teamwork that makes a company successful, or for that matter, any organization successful. And you have to understand business because Money turns out to be critical because money is what drives, that's how you pay people's salaries, that's how you buy the equipment that is needed, that's how you can travel back and forth. So you have to understand the business side. And quite often you have to make your arguments not by showing wonderful pictures and models and structures, but by showing Excel spreadsheets. And that's a different way of communicating, but you know, Designers learn that you should learn to understand the language of your customers and how they live. 
Well, your customers are the people in faraway places that use what you design, but your customers are also the people that you work for. And you have to make sure they succeed. So I claim that one of your jobs is to get your boss promoted. Because if you think of that way, that shows your value to the company. Or, and you, you have to understand the language, not of your boss, because presumably your boss understands you, but the boss of your boss and the boss of the boss of your boss. I've been on a number of boards, company boards and advisory committees. And I said the first time, oh, wonderful. I can help you do new products, new direction and so on. Like 80 to 90% of a board meeting is spent looking over the finances. The financial state of a company is critical for the life of a company. And so most of the discussions are around that. And you can bring in your wonderful ideas, but it has to be in those terms. We have to get rid of the unsustainable practices of companies, but we have to show a company how they can do that and still stay in business because it will cost them more money to do this at first. But I believe firmly that in the long run, they will save money. The problem is that the way the economic system works today, we are rewarded for short-term gains, not for long-term. So that has to change, but it can be changed. Believe me, it can be changed. So that's where designers can step in. Because again, one more thing, we focus on people. Every other organization focuses on, thinks about the same issues I'm talking about, but they wanna focus on productivity, on profitability, on scheduling, on cost. Uh, yeah, those are all important, but most important of all is people. Thanks for that, Don. Adam, did you have a question? Yeah, I can I can follow it up actually, Donna. We've had a we've had a question come in through the through the chat, and it's from Anna. And it's it's a question about how do you stay so engaged in this effort to improve the world for humanity? Uh, I often find myself feeling so fatigued and that my tiny efforts couldn't possibly matter. Well, your tiny efforts are can matter because it isn't that your efforts matter, it's that if you band together with other people trying to do the same thing, similar things, well, there are 8 billion people on this planet. You don't want to get together with all 8 billion of them, but if you get together with hundreds or even thousands, that makes a difference. So that's where your efforts make a difference because um, the, a lot of these issues are human behavior. That's the hardest problem to overcome. And human behavior is given a lot by the rewards, the reward systems that we give to um, people in academia, which the reward system is based upon publication in specialty journals, not about how well have you done to change the world or help the world. We have to change that in academics. In businesses, the reward system is based on your profits. And quite often, one part of the company is competing with another part of the company. They don't talk to each other. They're competing because there's a limited amount of bonus money that's going to be given out. So if, I, if you get more, then it means I get less. That's crazy, just crazy. And so we have to change the reward systems. And, um, well, people, by banding together, make a difference. Because, people, because companies will listen to their customers because customers buy their products. And uh, if it's enough customers are complaining, uh, they will listen. Politicians listen to, to the voters. Yes, they need money in order to stay in power, but in fact, they need the votes of people in order to stay in power. And so by raising your concerns, you will get politicians' attention and you might be able to change things, the regulatory systems. So people, alone don't make much difference. People banded together can change the world. Again, I look at some of the recent changes in society, dealing with gender, dealing with uh, discrimination. Uh, it's all because of people. Absolutely. Um, Don, I wanna revisit what you were talking about, that kind of artificiality. And we have a question from David Malton in the chat that, there, we're hearing a lot of buzzwords like AI and metaverse and others that suggest the principles of simulations or whatnot. To what extent shall we as UX professionals consider the design process as we design 
keeping these tools in mind? I believe that um, tools have always, I, I wrote a book called Things That Make Us Smart. I believe that uh, we are smarter and better because of much of the technology. Um, and so it, it we, but you have to use it properly. And so we are now engaged in what I consider a major technology shift to tools that are much more powerful than we've ever dreamed of. And in some sense, dangerous because of that. And just this morning though, I, I wrote a, a post uh, on my website. Um, so you can see it, it's, um, my, my website is JND. That's a psychological term that means just noticeably different. So jnd.org. And on the home page, you'll see a pointer to a discussion about chat TGP. And um, because the new, there's a wonderful paper that just came out from Microsoft Research. Uh, and it's authored by about 20 people. And those are major people. Uh, one of them is a friend who's a global vice president. Another one's a friend. He's the head of Microsoft Research. Yeah, and and uh, the lead author is a person who's been working on developing these chat programs. And what they did is they did a whole bunch of really interesting studies in which they demonstrated the strength of, of the new GTP and the weaknesses and the ways that that might actually be, be useful as tools or dangerous as tools. And I thought it was a really nice paper. Now it's 150 pages long, so don't be frightened by it because it's actually well-written and the only technical terms you're really ever going to encounter are GTP, which is a horrible name for something. And uh, just ignore it because you don't even have to know what they are or what, the, what it means. The paper is describing not how it works. The paper is describing what it does, the good stuff and the bad stuff and the surprising stuff. And if you don't want to read the paper, there's a 48 minute video by the, by the lead authors. That's really excellent. And I referred to it on my website. And I watched it at 1.5 speed, and uh, with, but I had chat on, I had the captions on, so it only took 25 minutes. Um, and it's excellent, really excellent. So look, what is it, why are you afraid? These things can't do anything without you. And the way they're going to be designed, these are their infancy now. So you can't really take what, there's, what they do today as what they're capable of. But they will be, I think, good, great collaborators. So the, for example, an artist won an art, uh, an art contest by presenting one of the pictures that he did with one of these machines. And then when people discovered it, they said, oh, that's horrible. He said, look, it took me a full month to get that picture. And I did 800 variations along the way. And the, I could not have done that without the system, but the system could not have done it without me. I, he said he felt it was a true collaboration as you, you, you ask for something and you get something and you say, yeah, that's not what I mean. So then you have to think about, well, how do I re-describe what I want? And how do I, because if you're doing a piece of art, how do you describe the things that you haven't drawn yet that you know it should be there? And that's, that's what's hard to do. But it, it means that as an artist, in this case, he was an artist, what he had to do was step back and say, okay, my skill of an artist is not going to be how carefully I can craft the lines or paint or sketch. My skill of an artist is what I can conceptualize in my head and then how I convey that to this other device that's going to have its own interpretation that will actually surprise me at times in positive ways. I'll say, wow, I never thought of that. Let's go in that direction. And if you, there are some now design tools, for example, Autodesk sells generative AI tools for doing the traditional kinds of designs we've been doing but usually for 3D printing. So it's things that you really can't do without a machine. And designers uh, who have used it told me that when they first heard about it, they hated it. They didn't want it. They thought it was unnecessary. It was an insult to say that they should use it. But they were, Autodesk, for some people, forced them to use it for a month. They said, please do us a favor. We need feedback from you. And after the month, they said, we don't want to give it back. It has changed the way I think, the way I do things, and it's caused me to be a better designer because I really had to think through exactly what I was asking for in the design. How big should this be? How strong would it have to be? Where does it have to fit? What should it look like? All of these issues. So I think this is going to be a wonderful positive change if we learn and are patient 
about how to use these things. But craft skills, a lot of those will not be necessary anymore for much of our work. We still will have great craftspeople and a lot of us will love that and buy it, but it won't be so as necessary as the design schools seem to think it is by the amount of time they spend teaching you the craft. Donya, would you say that's a flaw of the design education? Is oh, the design craft? education is badly flawed. <laughs> because if, if you want to deal with the world, if you want to do humanity centered design, you better understand the world. You need to have history. You need to understand politics. You need to understand literature. You need to understand people, sociology, anthropology, psychology, uh, communication. And um, that, those aren't taught in design schools, or if they are taught, they're taught briefly. They're not embedded. One thing that's also missing in design training is ethics. Most professional societies have ethical requirements and there's almost nothing that I can find in design. And actually I was involved in a movement to try to change design education. We, we thought that ethics was so important that it should not be a course. It should be embedded in all courses so that you don't, it isn't something you tack on at the end. It's something you're thinking about all the time. The problem is we couldn't, we, we formed an ethics group and it didn't produce a report that was appropriate. And so we don't have ethics in our recommendations because we couldn't find the people. So part of the problem is if I wanna change design education, well, today's design professors are the last person I have to ask because they aren't ready for this. They're gonna be insulted and they're gonna show me lots of counterexamples. And the counterexamples <laughs> will be true. Counterexamples are, Counterexamples are usually a, a minority, not a majority. Don, you're, there's a really lovely um, way of wording this that I really like, which talks about science discovers, genius invents, industry applies, and man adapts. Um, and then bringing that back to sort of a, the, this theme of modernity. And I, and I feel like, you know, as we've said, you know, it's, it's come to define savage inequities that you've mentioned. <clears throat> can it also come to define other things? Like how, how can modernity define things that aren't inequities and actually embrace potentially what you've just been talking about? Oh, no, my solution to the problem of modernity is to, is to stop it. Uh, because of modernity is a whole philosophy of life which says that, wow, we live in this wonderful age of, wow, do you know we can actually talk to somebody at a distance? Somebody invented something, they call it a water telephone and uh, electricity. And then pretty soon, in, you know, gasoline engines or steam engines that change the way we move things. And modernity was, well, humans finally are taking control. We can finally get, forget about nature and we can really make our lives better and richer and et cetera, et cetera. And that was what modernity was about. Uh, huge skyscrapers where everything was, in fact, part of the architecture was, we're gonna have this, here's the business school place and there's where you can do all your shopping and there's where you live without every thought to the fact that that makes your life miserable. If you take a look at the city of Brazil, Brasilia, which is the capital, that's how it was designed. And it's really, mis it's beautiful when seen from an airplane, the photographs, but it's miserable to work there because everything is isolated and you can't go from one person to another without getting into your car and driving. <clears throat> and um, much better is what today people are thinking about as a 15 minute city where everything is walkable. Wherever you live, you can just walk to shops. That's what makes New York City so wonderful. And Paris is starting to do this. And New York City, New York City people are often healthier than people who live in the suburbs and other places because they walk every place. You, and it, it's really nice that only, because it's a big enough city, almost anything you need to find, you can find. Because there may be a shop that only has a limited clientele, but it's such a big city, there's enough clientele to keep that shop going. And it's actually interesting because the, the big cities in the United States are tiny cities in India or in China. So I think modernity has passed. It's time for a new way of life. Thanks for that, Don. Um, <clears throat> I have a question for you. Uh, one of the tenets of your book is has shifted away from the idea of human centered and you talk about humanity centered you talk about that a lot tonight uh what's the difference and why the shift well as i said it's um 
it isn't human. Well, here I have here. Crib sheet. We have keep it here. It's, this is actually exactly from the book, and you can find it on my website. You don't have to search the book or even own the book. It says there are four principles of human centered design solve the core root issues, not just the symptoms that are presented to you. But when I consult, I always say, I'm not going to solve the problem you asked me to solve. I'm going to figure out what the real issue is and work on that one. Second, focus on people. Third, take a systems point of view. And four, continually test to refine because we're dealing with people and society. And so we don't, we don't always get it right. In fact, we almost always get it wrong the first time. So we really should always thinking of iterating. And in fact, even if you do the perfect design and it goes out and people love it, guess what? They will discover that they could do new things with it you never thought of. And then it's not perfect for those new things. So you still have to redesign. Okay, that's the four principles of human-centered design. So I say there are five principles of humanity-centered design. And the first four are simply expansions of the first four. First, solve the core root issues. That's the same as number one in human-centered design. Second, which was about focus on the people. Well, focus on the entire ecosystem of people, all living things in the physical environment and the very, all the different cultures in the world, make sure you're not destroying and, and contradicting their way of life. Third, it's a systems point of view. Uh, and that's the, Human centered, take a huge system point of view. Uh, humanity centered, take a long term system point of view, recognizing that most complications result from the interdependence of multiple parts. And many of the most damaging impacts on society and the ecosystem reveal themselves only years or decades later. A long term global point of view. And then the, the fourth one is both of them continually test to be fine to ensure they truly meet the concerns of the people and the ecosystem. Now, the fifth one is different. If I'm designing for a community, you know what the, all the, the colonialism is about? It's about a country going to another country and taking over, say, oh, we discovered new lands, new uninhabited territories, and we're going to live there and take it over. Well, that was always inhabited by indigenous people, but, these, but the European countries Went and just took it over anyway. And uh, America is also guilty of that in some sense. And moreover, the countries would often say, we don't like the way you're living and you're living in poverty. You're not living the way that we live. So we're going to help you by to live exactly the same way we live until they destroyed all sorts of wonderful cultures. And when the British said to the Indians, well, we're going to help you learn how to govern because we're good at governing. Uh, so you can be our assistants and help us. Well, that didn't go over well, but this colonialism where I'm gonna go and tell somebody else what to do is exactly what designers do. We sit and we design and yeah, we send out anthropologists and field study people to see what, how people live and what they do and so on. They come back and tell us and then we do our brainstorming and then we do our models and then we do our testing one probably on ourselves. And then we send it back to those people and say, here it is. And it's either conform or, or go away. We tell them how to behave and it doesn't work. And if you look at all the foreign aid that's gone on for years and years and years, billions of dollars, we send in the experts to say, oh, we see you have a sanitation problem. So the experts go in and they study it and they are experts. So they issue a huge report and say, here's how we're gonna solve it. It'll only take $10 billion. It will be done in 10 or 20 years but they don't ask the people, they don't consider the people or what their real issues are or what their capabilities are. And so this almost always fails. And even then it goes over budget and over schedule while failing. And so the argument now, which is again, this is not unique to me, we should not be designing for people. We should be designing with people, especially when it comes to these societal issues. Because look, there are 8 billion people in the world, and a lot of them are really, really intelligent. And when they're living in a problem in a city that has these problems, they know the problems. You don't need to send anthropologists in to tell them what the issues are or how they're living their life. And a lot of them have already started to address these issues. 
But the problem is they don't have many resources. And so they usually address the symptoms and not the underlying problem. And so designers can come in and be facilitators and mentors and help, can help them. So we help get to the core issues and not just the symptoms. And also help bring them, give them more supplies and help maybe fight the battles with the politicians about why this is so essential and why we should let the people decide upon what they need, not us outside experts who don't understand the people in that area. So that's humanity-centered design. Can I, can I ask what role does science play as a supporting or as a, um, a tool for designers as part of that, that battle potentially or that, that conversation? Um, one of the interesting ideas, which I got from uh, some Italian designers, is that designers should think of themselves as conductors of a symphony, that, the, that there, we need many different disciplines to solve any one of these problems. If you think about sanitation, wow, we need civil engineers, we need uh, public health experts, we need uh, all sorts of, there's going to be lots of design of physical devices, pumps and toilets and sinks. And, um, and it's really difficult, by the way, one of the difficulties is separating the clean water from the sewage pipes, especially because pipes always leak. And so you have to make sure that uh, there's always pressure in the water pipes so that when it leaks, it's leaking out, clean water leaks out and not sewage water leaking in. And there's all sorts of complications about doing this that require experts. And so what designers are really good at, because you know, design doesn't have any content matter expertise. Design is a set of methods. I think that's one of design's power that we don't know. So we have to become fast learners and we have to learn who the experts are and bring them together but then we have to help the experts translate their knowledge into things that fit into the project. And so th th that's what I think the, the real role of designers is going to be. Now, there are uh, project planners and there are project managers in the whole field of project management that says that's what they deal with. And I say we should, we should partner with them because they're good at many things. But what they deal with mainly is in logistics, and the, the timing and scheduling everything to make sure it all works and getting the right people together at the right time. And that's really difficult. Let them do that. But they, again, focus primarily on productivity, uh, costs, uh, et cetera. They don't focus on people, on making it good for people. They want to make sure that everything's done on schedule and on budget. And so the designers play that role. Yeah. But again, that's not how we train designers. So this requires a whole new set of training for designers who are going to do these kinds of projects. Well, what can we do, Don? What, would, what training do you think that would be beneficial for that conductor role? Well, you have to be a generalist. You have to understand uh, all those other areas. And, um, you know, I've been talking to a, a bunch of design schools and the design schools that have been really impressed me the most are in India, because India is now building all sorts of new design schools, and not the old ones. There's a whole bunch of traditional design schools in India that are very much like, like the Western design schools, because all the professors were trained in the West, etc. cetera. Um, and, but these new schools, instead of having everybody becomes a major, and you learn your major, and you become really good at the topics in your major, well, that's not the way that designers work. Designers have to go cut across all these specialties. And so there's one school called uh, CREA uh, and another school called Blame that I've just been talking to. And I gave a talk in CREA and I was really impressed with the questions I got asked. And I kept telling the students, it was all students asking me questions that I can't answer your questions. That's wonderful. But, the, you were asking us the most important critical problems that we're facing, and we don't have the answers to that. And so I encourage you to keep asking those questions, but you know what? It's students like you who are going to provide the answers. And their school did that. Their school basically cuts across all the boundaries and students get a broad education. And Flame is the same way. I just talked to the people at Flame a couple of weeks ago, and I actually helped them set up the curriculum about a year ago. 
And uh, they are insisting that these eiders have to be what they call pie-shaped. On the top, there's this broad horizontal education that everyone has to have about humanities, about art, about technology, about science, about et cetera. And then there's a specialty, like there'll be things in design you're gonna specialize in. And then there'll be some other area that you have to specialize in. You choose, but it could be economics, it could be business, it could be law, it could be politics, it could be whatever you are interested in. But that combination makes you very broad and therefore, therefore also able to learn other types of areas when necessary. That's the kind of training that's going to be necessary. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that many moons ago, Don, when I went to university, I studied journalism and 75% of my courses were outside of journalism. They wanted us to get that broad perspective instead of most of my courses focus on the trade of journalism. Yes. Well, in fact, when I tell people, you have to really understand people and what, what field do you think understands people the best? Psychology, sociology, anthropology? I say, no. It's literature. If you're writing a novel, you have to make it live. You have to make the, the people interact ways that are understandable, that people say, yeah, I know people like that. Or I hate those people. I know the people just like that. I hate them. Or I love people who are trying to do that. And you have to really be a great observer of people. And the reason that, that good people, good writers and good journalists are so good is because you have to be curious. Journalists, by the way, have this other problem too, is that they have to be generalists because you may want to write a story about any topic. So you have to learn quickly. And um, it, by, but the specialties stop you from being curious. The specialties say you learn more and more about your specialty. Well, if you want to write novels, you can't be a specialist. You have to observe people in all sorts of situations and then create. If you ever read Kim Sim Stanley Robinson's books, like The Ministry of the Future or The Mars Trilogy, he talks about real events in artificial places, but he, he does a really great job of creating the people behind the scenes. And that now these people are gonna inhabit Mars and they have starting from scratch and it's gonna be wonderful because they have these dreams and idealistic dreams and they will set up the perfect society. And he demonstrates how these people end up with the same kind of fights and feuds and different points of view. And uh, they, they start killing one another and they start fighting with each other for just these reasons. And that red Mars is against green Mars is against blue Mars. And in the United States, in today's world, red is bad and green is good. But in Mars, it was the opposite <laughs> because Mars is called the red planet today. And so the red Mars people wanted to keep Mars the way it is. They didn't want to destroy it. And the green Mars people wanted to, no, we're gonna make an artificial atmosphere. We're gonna change it so we can grow green plants and live in a comfortable life. And, but the point is he was able to do this because he's such a wonderful observer of how people act. So I recommend his ministry of the future because it's all about climate change. Okay, cool. I have a question here from Fanny. And earlier you talked about making an impact and having influence. And Fanny wants to know, where as UX designers and researchers, do you think that we can make an impact to make real differences in the world now <clears throat> based on your experiences or your, or your thoughts? Where can we make an impact? That's not where the impact will be. The impact's going to be with on a broader goal, but you have to earn. You have to earn the right to be a major spokesperson, <clears throat> and you have to earn the right, as I said, by first of all learning the language, but also proving to people that you're competent. And um, you know, I've I've written many broad, general, theoretical pieces over my life, and these paper the books are always fairly broad in what they're talking about. Uh, and I've covered many different topics. Each book is on a different topic. But I had to earn that. And I earned that by doing essentially the journey work as a, as a beginning uh, professor, uh, publishing papers that were specialist in nature and pushing forth and trying to advance a specialized discipline. And over time, uh, I earned that reputation, which allowed me to go on and say bigger things, which allow people just to say, oh, well, he's doing pretty good work on um, 
memory models of human memory or how human attention might work. And so let's maybe I'll listen to what he's writing about here. But even there, you have to learn how to do it. I wrote a paper on human error uh, and I sent it to the best journal in psychology, the Psychological Review. And the editor sent it back in like an hour. And the entire, what he said, the entire note, which he said, he sent it back and said, come on, Don. And um, what, he, <laughs> what happened was that I wrote the paper by starting, here's how, this is a scientific journal. And I started by saying, the other day I visited a friend of mine and at dinner, he said, let's have some, let's have some scotch. So he went to the, his cabinet and he opened the cabinet and he pulled out a bottle of scotch and two glasses and he poured scotch into the glasses. And then he put the glasses back into the cabinet, shut the door and walked off with the bottle. Uh, <laughs> that's not what he meant. And that really got me going. And I said, that's, uh, gee, I could imagine making that error. He said, oh, I'm getting old. And I said, well, I do it. And that's how I, that's how I opened up the paper. Well, that doesn't work in the scientific literature. So basically what I did was take that example out and make it a little bit more dull. And <laughs> then he published it as the first paper in the journal and uh, with no, require, no revisions required. But you have to learn, first of all, he knew who I was. We, we were friends, we talked to each other before. But second of all, I wasn't playing by the rules and I had to start playing by the rules. <laughs> Oh, I've got a you feeling to, you're because, good at not playing by the rules. I'm good at not playing by the rules, but I had to do it enough to be able to earn the trust of, I didn't earn the trust of everybody, but I earned the trust of the people I cared about. Actually, it isn't that I didn't earn, it isn't that people mistrusted me. Look, my first job, I was at Harvard and I got introduced to the faculty and then one of the faculty members stood up and, basically damned my field and my and what I was trying to do and why was I even here. Now that faculty member was D.F. Skinner, who was the most famous psychologist of the 20th century. Uh, and you know what? I took that as a compliment because I was trying to change the world from thinking the way Skinner did to thinking uh, as information processing psychology, which is what I was trying to develop. And he was a behaviorist who didn't believe in understanding what went on inside the head because you can't see it. And um, so I got, the, I got the attention of other people, the person who had hired me for, at Harvard. But um, you can't please everybody. But my goal was not to make enemies of, it, of Skinner. And he was always polite to me and I was polite to him. And I was, and I was friends of a bunch of people who called themselves Canarians. But I, we, we disagree strongly about what psychology ought to be. And, um, and that's okay. In fact, disagreements are often better than agreements because you learn from disagreements. Yeah. Don, I've got a question from Bianca. You've seen a huge amount of technological change in your lifetime. What are you most excited about right now? <laughs> I've told you already, I'm most excited well, I'm going to modify what I was going to say. I am most excited about the technological changes happening with the power of artificial intelligence. Um, it's By the way, artificial intelligence is not just chat. But when you take a picture today with your phone, it automatically focuses, it automatically gets the right exposure. It, it can blur the background if you want it to or not. And you get unbelievably good pictures. When I started, I'm an expert in photography and the science of photography. And I said, there's no way that a phone camera could ever be as good as a real camera because look how small the detector is and then not enough photons are going to hit it to be able to give you much detail. Well, I was wrong, but I was wrong because people invented these clever things. So for example, today, when you get these wonderfully sharp pictures on this tiny little camera, it's because it's taken about five or 10 pictures quickly. And then it's put them together, one on top of the other, so that, yeah, you didn't, you don't have 10 times the area, but you have 10 different pictures, which is equivalent to having 10 times the area. And you can combine it. And so there's all sorts of things that have happened. And so that's AI. The automobile that says, that forces you to keep at a safe distance with the car in front of you, that's AI. 
or keeps you in your lane, that's AI. Uh, uh, systems that do radiology or systems that help physicians or uh, the continuous glucose monitor that measures your continually measuring your glucose level for people with diabetes. And then sometimes with some companies like Insulet, uh, tell the insulin pump just when and how much insulin to give you. So you don't even have to worry about it. You're just wearing two patches on the skin. That's AI. <clears throat> so all these things are changing lives for the better. And the new Chad, I believe, will be a great collaborator and lead us to new things. That's one thing. But the other thing I'm really excited about is changing the design process <clears throat> so that we actually do make a better world. And that's why I'm delighted to have people like Bob with me and others who are arguing for the same thing because as I said, a single individual doesn't make a difference, but enough people together saying similar thing will make a real difference. Can I ask uh, another question? It's, it's, it relates to waste. Um, and so, you know, waste continues to be one of the biggest sort of issues facing humanity. Um, is the is the biggest potential impact to focus on behavior as individuals or as or to focus on industry as one of the, the ways that we could potentially you know seek to reduce that impact of waste? Well, on one level, you have to do it all. Um, but if you take a look at where the waste comes from, some of it is our behavior. But the behavior was there because industry taught us back when plastics were first developed, plastic was a the thing, and they we did they were delighted to say, hey. We've simplified your life. You can use our plastic dishes or our paper dishes and you can use it for your dinner party and then throw it away. You no, know, you don't have to do any more dishwashing. And so this single the notion of single use of usage of packages and all sorts of things came out of industry. And we all thought that was wonderful because we assumed it never occurred to us that this waste would pile up to the amount that it has. Now, maybe it should have, but it didn't. And, um, but I think that uh, things are changing. So a lot of people now are really trying to say, well, can we design things differently? Or can we use different materials? And just the other day, I read about a startup that is trying to make one use uh, coffee cups, single use coffee cups. Uh, but what they do is they make them, they're very thin, they're very beautiful. Uh, and the trouble with paper pour coffee cups, yeah, you could recycle paper if it weren't destroyed by the coffee, uh, but you to prevent the, paper, the coffee from getting into the paper, you cover it with a little thin plastic lining and the plastic lining is very difficult to take off and therefore the cups can't be recycled. The same with your milk carton, same problem. But these people are making these thin cups out of clay. And what they say is, when you're all finished with it, it was like, I just ate a banana and I have a peel now left, I throw it on the ground. You don't wanna do this in the middle of a city street, but in the country, you could throw it on the ground. And when it decomposes, it becomes fertilizer for more plants. And uh, the cup is made out of clay. So they say, just step on it, break it into little pieces and dump it into the earth. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's because it came from, it was dirt and now it's going back to dirt. And so that's very clever. And they've made a million cups already. And now they're trying to enlarge their business and get funding to do it. But it's a clever idea. Now, it's not completely, it's not circular design. Circular design is that you can reuse the very same parts. I make an automobile and I keep repairing it. And then at some time, it leave, it's the end of the life. So I can take it apart and reuse all the parts in, say, new automobiles. I can melt them down. Uh, and recast the metal and glass are the two easiest things to recycle. And I can use the components. And so a lot, I, there's almost no waste. And I don't need to do more mining for new materials because I'm using it from the old cars. Well, with these coffee cups, it's now you still destroy the environment in mining huge amounts of clay in order to make this for a large population. Although their hope is that that won't be such a problem because it'll be locally made. They, it'll be made by 3D printers. So every little city or even parts of a city can make them themselves. And they don't leave huge amounts of clay for their small community. Uh, but even there, uh, to mine 
clay requires huge expensive equipment that uses fossil fuel today and is that harms the environment. And uh, the assumption that you can recycle it depends a lot upon how you recycle it. And if you're in the city, that's a different, more complex problem. But if you take a look at an espresso coffee maker, I don't, don't worry about whether you like it or hate the coffee that comes out, but the important point is it's very convenient and it comes in little aluminum or metal containers. And espresso tells you to send it back to them because they are going to use the coffee that's in it as fertilizer, and they're going to use the shell. They're going to remelt it and use it to make more uh, coffee cup containers. And so um, that's circular economy. And so we need more people like that and more designers who think that way. Oh, and I'll have to send you one of our ceramic ceramic coffee cups that we've got down here. Sorry, Jen, I know you've got another question. Well, the ceramic coffee cups are nice because they're multiple use. But the problem is that uh, you don't always walk around with coffee cups. And so no, what they're doing is occasionally you really do want something and when you're single use. But yes, it's, uh, it's far better to have, a, you know, if you drink a lot of water, I always use the same glass. Or when I'm traveling, well, my wife usually carries a little water container. So it's refillable or refillable. But again, that's not always available. No, yeah, that's a good point, for sure. Not, not, not particularly good in my back pocket, so that's right. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> very, very true. So, Don, uh, I kind of want to wrap up with, we've get, been getting a lot of questions about um, asking for examples of humanity-centered design. Have you seen some good ones? Is there any that you'd like to share? Uh, I know you've talked about it in your book a bit, but um, any you'd like to share to, today that, you're you're particularly impressed with and interested in following to see how it goes. Uh, maybe I'll call on Bob to see if you have any good examples you can help me with. It's actually hard to find the good examples because this is a. Uh, is it too new? In, in the uh, I've been making I've been looking primarily in the societal projects in the uh, the way that the various foundations and government are trying to do in to do uh, foreign aid essentially. And it's difficult to find the really good examples. Um, I know there are some, but yes, Bob, unmute yourself. No, mute, mute, mute. So Bob is trying to talk or he needs- I'm trying to unmute you, Bob. Are you getting any success? There you yeah, go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Don. I, that was one of the challenges I had too. And I, I, I think the secret is um, what you mentioned at the very beginning is that we have to think much more broadly about design and who designers are. And uh, one of the first examples that I use of what I call everyday designers uh, is uh, Chef Jose Andrex. Uh, who uh, is a world famous uh, chef uh, in his own right, has many uh, 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 high class restaurants all over the US. Uh, but uh, uh, in addition to designing these, uh, these uh, very exquisite uh, meals for a lot of money, he's designed what's called World Central Kitchen. Uh, and uh, has fed millions of people uh, around the world. And what makes that a design is that uh, each intervention has to be specialized to that particular context, whether it's the war in Ukraine or the uh, uh, hurricane in, uh, in San Juan in Puerto Rico or uh, a massive fire in California, uh, the response has to be specific to that situation and that community, and it draws on local people. Um, so each intervention has to be kind of put together, designed specifically to that particular problem. So I, that would be one example, and um, and there there are a number of others that I talk about, but I, I, it a lot of it has to do with thinking beyond just products and 
services that feed the consumer uh, economy. Actually, that reminded me of an example here in San Diego, where I, uh, <clears throat> we were, I was talking to uh, a bunch of community leaders in the, uh, I don't know how to describe it. You have to be very careful in language and talking about it. Uh, but they're basically the poorer sections of San Diego. And one of the things they did was um, a woman, they, did, they wanted to serve food at all their events. And so uh, a woman volunteered, uh, first of all, to, to make the food, but, but then she realized there were, the, the number of events that were coming up were too much. So what she did is she, she started teaching people to cook for these events. But again, what she did was she didn't say, here's the recipes and let me explain how to cook. She, she found out what they, were, what they were used to eating and what they were able to cook. And they could often cook really nice things for their family, but that's different than cooking for a, a big group of people, like 20 or 30 or 50 people. And so she developed that into a cooking course. And not only that, but she trained all these cooks to be trainers of other cooks. So pretty soon it expanded so that uh, the number of people trained to, to make their living now is cooking for for events, for family affairs, and for big public events and so on, is boomeranging because it's an exponential growth. Uh, I teach you, you teach, I teach five people, and my, each of those five people teaches five people, et cetera. And that's an example of the community building it itself. No one told them to do this. The community themselves invented this. John, we've had a lot of questions around this uh, particular theme, and I just want to read Kimmy's question out because I think it sort of encapsulates a lot of the other questions that have come through. And it's something that I've battled myself and know some of my friends also struggle with is burnout, especially when met with complete resistance or reluctance to the idea of UX. So the question is, how can we as UX professionals avoid getting burnt out too quickly if or when we're continuously met with resistance? There's a, there's a whole community concerned about uh, work and why work is defined the way it is, that work takes over our lives, dominates our lives. We spend more time at work than we do with our families. And, uh, and work has come to define your success story. And so uh, yet many people hate the work they do. They do it only in order to earn the money. And they're often treated badly because they're treated as a number, they're treated as a, a a component of the company. And so whenever that happens, you easily get burned out and uh, people are stressed. So one of, the, one of the biggest places where this happens, besides the people who are manufacturing lines or on the chicken slaughtering packaging lines is in hospitals where the physicians are all burned out because they're continually uh, under pressure um, and they're under pressure not just to do they would love to do medicine, but they don't have time to do medicine. They're told you can only spend 15 minutes on a patient, literally 15 minutes. Uh, they get to spend 30 minutes with me because I'm old. These old patients are allowed more time. And that's crazy. And uh, it should be a function of how, how ill the person is, not how old they are or how much money they have. And so there's a high suicide rate among physicians. Uh, there's a high dropout rate, and there's also a high error rate because being stressed leads to more errors. And the work, it's the work environment that really is bad. So the, 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 the university, my health department at the University of California, the, the medical system, was very concerned about the complaints of, of patients who are complaining about the service and the quality of health. And um, so they, they decided to improve patient experience and they worked hard on it and they hired somebody who didn't know anything at all about patient experience. And I tried to, they brought me in to help, but they didn't listen to me. And I tried to tell them that, you know, if you really want the patient to have a good experience, you better make sure your hospital staff has a good experience, not just the physicians, but the nurses and the technicians and even the people who clean the place and even the people who, who uh, schedule things and who, take care of your cars and all that sort of stuff. They just wouldn't believe that. But, uh, but actually the people who work in these areas say that over and over and over again. In fact, I'm giving a talk to a group in a, about a week. It's called, they call themselves HX. And that's human experience. And these are the people who used to be human relations, the people in the, in the company that's supposed to take care of uh, hiring and firing and the rules, et cetera. 
And they said that these, that we were actually doing harm to the people who work here. We have all these rules people have to follow. We often don't even really know what their jobs are. We make up these arbitrary rules because they sound logical and sensible. And they're trying to switch that so that they're really looking at the people's experience. And studies have shown that uh, the, the, there's a wonderful study where they compared uh, two chicken factories, two of the biggest in the, in the country, in fact, where the laborers in one were being treated like replaceable items. And they had a fierce schedule ahead of me. They were paid fairly low wages. They, in order to take a, a toilet break, they had to get permission and then they were timed and how long they were out. Uh, they uh, could not get, they, they were not treated well when they got sick, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one paid their people more and treated them better and gave them more control over their own lives. And it cost them more money. But if you took a long-term point of view, the, the one that treated their, their people better, actually were, their costs were lower. Less people quit. They had to spend less money continually hiring people to replace the ones that quit and then retraining them. Uh, the people were more happy in their jobs, so they did a better job, so there were less errors, which meant uh, in, in, in food industry, an error can be catastrophic because it can lead to disease. And um, they, overall, in the long term, they benefited. So I think we have to completely revolutionize the way we work. And, you know, people used to work for six hour days, six day weeks, I mean, and it was like 10 or 12 hours a day. And it took a long time to switch that to lower amounts and then five day weeks and then finally eight hour days. Well, there's now a big push to make it four day weeks. And the evidence seems to show that in four days you do just as much work and just as effective as in five days, but you have a much more friendly life. And I think that's the sort of thing that we have to think about is new ways of changing the way we live. And just because the industrial revolution forced this kind of work ethic on it, doesn't mean that's natural or appropriate. Absolutely. And I know we had a ton of questions that were submitted and Adam and I came up with a whole bunch and we are clearly not going to get to all of them, probably not in our lifetime, certainly not in this session. I just have one more final question for you, Don, and that is, is there anything that we didn't talk about today that you'd like to share? I don't think so. I mean, there's lots of things I could talk about, but, and lots of issues that you have not covered, but I think I covered the fundamentals, the fundamental principle that's governing how we should approach these things. And that's what matters because then you can take those some principles and apply them to almost any problem that shows up. Absolutely, I think that's fair. Thank you so much for your time. Everybody give Don like claps if your video's on or virtual reaction in, in, the, in the bottom of Zoom. Thank you, this was super enlightening. It was very aligned to what I read in the book. So it was great to hear everything live from from you as opposed to reading it for the first time and when I read the book. And um, there we uh, should be, we'll throw the link in the chat again so that you could get Don's book. Um, it should be in there, but we will toss that in there again because it's a great read, I really recommend it. And at this point, we are going to um, transition to networking, but before you go, I do have a request in a couple of quick announcements. And one is um, please fill in the survey. Let us know uh, what you thought of today's event. Your feedback is really valuable to us. And for those who are concerned like, hey, I wanna see the recording, how do I get that? That is gonna be sent to you. We have, a, it's gonna be hosted on Vimeo and that recording is gonna be sent to you. Access is gonna be sent via email. And it's gonna be sent to the email that you use to register for this event on Eventbrite. So don't go over to YouTube, it's not gonna be there. Give us a little bit of time to process the video, give us a few days, but that's how you're gonna access the recording is we're gonna email you a unique link that's tied to your registration for this event. So again, Don, thank you so much. This has been super enlightening and great. And I'm going to uh, transition us to the networking aspect of today's uh, event. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. So I'm going to leave you because okay. I, can, 
I've been on Zoom calls since early this morning and uh, I need to get back uh, to my family. All right. Thank okay. you again, Don. Very it was nice wonderful. To see you Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Okay. So let me share my screen. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, here we go. Nope. All right. So again, I understand that some people may not be really feeling the networking aspects, and I totally understand that. So this is your opportunity to bow out gracefully. Um, but I do encourage you to stay because it's a great opportunity to meet new people and to talk to others about what you um, heard tonight and just to expand your network, right? So uh, a few house rules. We really... Uh, expect a, a respectful community and experience. So we expect you to adhere to that when you go to your breakout rooms as well. So no offensive comments, you know, be kind and empathetic and treat others with respect as you would like to, you know, you too would like to be treated with, right? So um, I am going to go to the next screen, which is the first topic. So when you go into your breakout rooms, we're gonna automatically assign you, we're gonna give you like 12 to 15 minutes to go into the breakout rooms and first introduce yourself, tell, say what your name is, and then what your kind of, you know, your specialty is. If you are a designer or a researcher or strategist, or, you know, in Bob's case, you're an author and a lot of other things. So go ahead and say uh, kind of what you do or what you'd like to do if you're still trying to figure that out. And our first topic is what were the major takeaways that you had from tonight's talk, uh, Design for a Better Word, World, which is the topic of the book. So get your LinkedIn. Um, link handy because you're going to throw that in the chat and when you go into the breakout rooms that linkedin is only going to be shared with those people it's only a temporary kind of thing when you go in the chat in the breakout room so have that ready because it's it's kind of handy to like connect with people and sometimes you're like oh wait i forgot to get their linkedin so get that ready have that ready to share and i am going to get you into some breakout rooms here does anybody have any questions before we go into our first? So what we're going to do, go into a breakout room, 12 to 15 minutes, introduce yourself, talk about the topic, make new friends. We'll come back to the lobby here and then we'll break into a second room and I'll give you that topic and we'll do the process again. OK, makes sense. Everybody clear on that. All right. Excellent. So let's get the breakout rooms going. And here we go. All right, you have to hit join. So you're going to get a prompt on your screen that says join, and you're going to say yes. OK, and what this is is just kind of open forum. Anybody can ask questions anybody could answer so i ask that you use the raise your hand emoji because so that we get a little bit of a, a line up here of who's got questions but um feel free anybody have any questions and anybody uh is welcome to answer all i ask is like share the stage this isn't your own personal show you know we want to share multiple perspectives so give other people a chance mm -hmm. to um talk and share and ask questions as well and um, it looks like, let me, uh, Anisha. Anisha, Hi, everyone. feel free to ask your question. Yeah, good morning, evening, night, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an international student in Quebec, Canada. I'm doing my PhD in uh, cellular and molecular biology. So hopefully I'll be done by end of summer, early fall this year, finger crossed. So I'm planning to transition to the UX research because I like research and I really love psychology part of it. To be honest, I didn't know UXR existed <laughs> after a lot, two years of re going downhill on the internet, I found this path. So my question is because of my background, I think in the current market, I'll have more 
age on with connecting with the companies that are in healthcare, biotech, or pharma background. And if I'm wrong, just let me know. And my plan is to uh, do a Coursera course because I don't have money with doing PhD and stuff. So to get into that, no terminologies and stuff before uh, applying. So, and also because immigration is a problem as an international student, uh, even though a lot of uh, pharma and healthcare companies are there who have UX research in United States and UK, but that is not much around the world. So sure, yeah. Uh, so give us whatever, and whoever want to give me some wisdom, just do away. Sure, um, Adam, I'm going to call on you um, because she mentioned the pharma background, and I know. I don't know that you were from pharma background, but you come from a similar similar science background. Do That's you true, have any, yeah. Do you have any advice on how to apply those skills and transition into UX, if at all? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, yeah, so I'm a pharmacologist by background. And um, I think it's from a research perspective, the training that we get in science, it's very translatable. In, if anything, designers ripped off the approach of, research in terms of a research plan which is actually an aim method you know um, hypothesis results conclusion iterate that's called a science experiment so if you take that training and you turn that into research and you use that and you observe and you get evidence-based insights then you can improve experiences and I think it's a very strong training from being a scientist to transitioning into design if anything it's a very natural one and you could argue that that's really just what scientists are doing anyway you're just applying it to um, you just apply it to humans instead of neutron tomography. Thanks for that, Adam. I'll throw in a little tip, and that would be that since you do have that background, maybe look for jobs in that field because you understand that field well, more so than if somebody comes from a different background, not that science and pharma background. So that's going to be, um, a, you don't have to upskill and learn the industry, you already know the industry. So that's gonna help you if you're interested in, in continuing in that, in that industry, even if as a UX researcher. Um, anybody else have any uh, thing they'd like to share and share with Anisha? Hi, Anisha, my name is Clyde. I'm still pretty early on in my career for UX, but I just wanted to kind of be that person like, don't be afraid to like put yourself out there and go for it. Like I know sometimes like I'm a teacher transitioning into UX and I feel like sometimes my imposter syndrome gets the best of me. So like have some confidence and really go for it. And I'm sure no matter what's going to happen, you're going to do great. Um, just make that leap because sometimes that's all we need. And I hope that really helps. Thanks, Clyde. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Um, All right. I'd like to go All next. Right. Well, uh, well, with uh, the to answer uh, Anisha's question answer or to Anisha's ask a question? question? No, just to answer that question. Okay. Like I would say, okay. stay curious and trust the process. Like under uh, identify what the goal is and how close or far away from that goal you are. But trust the process. That helps most of the time. Thanks for that. Uh, David, you are next in line on my screen, so I will uh, ask you to go next. Unmute. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So Don mentioned something about the, you know, essentially reinventing the UX designer degree, like that, how it has to be the generalist and then have these different focuses on things. I think I've ended up in that that space that my undergrad degree was in manufacturing and then I went to work in the oil fields and then I worked in aerospace and I worked in defense and now I work in finance. So I've gained a lot of perspective over that. Um, but I'm curious to see if there's anyone here, you know, and, and I currently work in a learning environment within within finance. So I'm, I'm doing um, client facing learning, how to help come up with on demand courses to help uh people learn 
when they can. So they're on demand uh, to work around their schedules. But I'm starting to wonder if anyone here has experience with, is there a similar thing going on with just not even just UX designers, but the whole university system? Like, is the model still sustainable, still viable? Has anyone had a chance to, to dig into as the rising costs of schools have gone up? Is it still even a thing or can you jump into UX without even having that whole college model and kind of make your own path to get there or to UX or any other degree or focus area for that matter? Are, may I ask? Uh, so are you talking about, say, like workshops, putting workshops together and training modules yourself? Is that what you're asking? Uh, I, I'd say take it in. No, no. So, so let me I be more clear. Yeah, so the model of university to train somebody, to educate them, to be ready to jump into a corporate role and make an impact. Yeah. Can, is, can, that, can, is that still a sustainable model? Yes. What, yeah, of, of course. <laughs> so are you talking about, say, for example, continuing education, things like that? I think well, he's like, asking, is the traditional go to university to get a degree the path to get into user experience? Is that what you're asking, David? Right. Is, is it worth spending $200,000 or more to get a degree to go get a role that pays fifty dollars 60000 for way too many years? Wow. Yeah, I come, see your, you need to come down uh, to see that's $200,000. Oh. That's a fantastic <laughs> deal. Come down here. Come, <laughs> I reckon we can do you a deal. <laughs> I wanted to comment on this as someone who went back to school to get my master's to get into UX. Um, I actually, I was just talking to my coworker um, who she's working right now in UX um, as a UX researcher. She's going back to school to get her master's degree and she is finding, um, she's finding it really frustrating like we just had this conversation today about how frustrating it is at the um, some of the things that school really doesn't teach you. I think there's still a place for it though. And I think the place for it is if you have no background in the field at all, you need some education on it. You need some education on design methodologies. Like you need some foundational knowledge of the subject if that's a, I'm I'm going to be honest, I'm paying for a $90,000 program. It's a huge investment that a lot of people can't take. It's just, it's a, it's a gargantuan amount of money. Um, you are getting some things though, that like you wouldn't get if you didn't go into a program. I think you, in the program that I'm in right now, I'm working with some of the top researchers in the fields of accessibility and computer science in UX design and research. And I wouldn't get that if I just went and kept trying to apply and apply and apply and apply. I also, in having gone back to school as a student, I qualify for internships. And that was really the biggest reason why I went back is because internships are kind of the true only entry level jobs right now. Um, and going back to school gave me the opportunity to qualify for internships, which is kind of a sad reality, but that is yeah. how it is. And that was the the main factor why I went back to school. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good point, point Lizzie. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's another thing too, is like the negatives though, is that like, you don't really learn unless you're getting an MBA, you don't really learn about strategy. You don't learn about practice in the corporate world unless you do the work in the corporate world and that's what an internship or apprenticeship is really great at is teaching you this is what the work looks like in the real real world um so to answer that question is hard to answer i guess is what i'm gonna i'm gonna come to it's really hard to answer yeah. and it's really dependent on you as a person what you can do how much you can like cost time um like resources you have to go into it, it it depends. Unfortunately, <laughs> it depends. Yeah. that's good input. I, Thank you. And yeah, then, David, yeah. you're going to get as many answers as people mm -hmm. on this on this forum, right? Um, I don't know if anybody who has their hand up 
is hands up to answer this. Is that the case? Okay, so Victoria, I know because there's a lot of, Victoria, you want to go ahead and, and provide a pr perspective? Sure, thank you. Um, even though I agree with um, Lizzie, if I got that correctly, um, I think I find the UX field, either you designer or researcher, um, a field that allows you to enter from different paths. If you have any type of college degree, I think it will help you, especially if it's in social science, if you go the research path, because you're already doing research as a student, as a bachelor or even match, master, or you study psychology or sociology class or anthropology, that helps you and understanding a little bit more about the societies and human behaviors and as collectives and individuals. So if you have that, I don't think you need, I would argue that you don't need special education in the UX field because with all other resources that are out there, you constantly can learn and kind of gain that knowledge or cover those gaps that you feel that are missing. Um, same with the design. I think there are a lot of tools and courses that allows you to kind of educate yourself in that field. Might not be the case for others where you can argue that you do need a formal education, but I think in our world with all developments that we have, we're moving towards where the non-formal education and the formal education, they kind of get at the same level in terms of the knowledge that they give you. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, the non-formal education, which is Coursera or other platforms, they are more affordable and more people are drawn to those. So I think it's, um, and especially UX field is also a field that constantly change. So what you learn now might not be available in the next five years. So it's always like a question about the investment that you make, the value that you're going to get back and for how long you're going to get it. But I would say non-formal is is pretty good route to to get into it if you if you want to do it. Thanks. Thank you okay. for that, you. Uh, Victoria. Um, any other hands specifically for this answer? Okay, because one more, uh, Michelle. I have. Yep, Michelle. I have you. You next in line, and then we'll go one more like brief perspective, and then we'll uh, move on to the. Uh, Holland has a question, so yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Asking, I don't know why it keeps, it keeps not letting you do that. I don't know why it will not. Is that better? Yes. So I just, Oops, I think I just muted you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Try it again. Oh, this is a nice, fun Zoom setting that is new. Okay. Oh, did we lose her? Oh, I think we no, did. Uh, oh, is she here? She put she her go? hand down, so she went over. Oh. Uh, Michelle, are you still here? Are you giving up on technology? Because, girl, I'm with you. She's I feel still that pain. muted. No, I, I appreciate the call. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take my hand down so we can get to Colin. Thank you all so much. All right, Colin, go ahead and go. Hopefully, we can figure out this unmute thing. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be here with everybody in the space. I'm, uh, I'm new to UX, so I have a background in graphic design and photography, and I'm currently in UX Academy, so very, very early on, and I'm starting to think about, like, my portfolio and, like, what that looks like to become, like, a, um, I don't know, more of a competitive applicant, I guess you can say, and so I'm wondering if anyone has any ideas on how I can maybe, like, leverage some of my background with photography and even graphic design to create a very uh, just a nice portfolio uh going into these different interviews so yeah that was the question that i had so i actually just made my portfolio and i am not good at any of the things that you are good at but there's a <laughs> wonderful website called uxfold.io that has a lot of ton very easy to use graphic design tools that lets you create like a very visually appealing portfolio and gives you like a cool access link and it's free for one case study. So if you want to do more then you can pay like nine bucks, but other, uh, nine bucks a month or for that, but otherwise it's free if you only have one, which I did. So uh, might be worth checking out. Wait, would you mind putting that link in the. Yeah, sure. The... Yeah. I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Colin, I have one clarifying question. Do you mean like the visual, like, 
layout and design of things? Or do you mean like how you leverage personally your skills from graphic design to your portfolio? Because I feel like that can get a little bit lost in the mix. Which one do you mean? For the second set, for sure. So definitely like how can I leverage like that background, you know, my, my experience in graphic design and photography to transition over to UX? Okay, great. Thank you. I just wanted to ask because I was a little confused <laughs> myself. I don't have an answer, but I'm sure somebody else great in this forum does. Sure. Yeah, Thank as, you. I, I, as someone that hires, uh, you know, um, I, I think it's it's important to to leverage what you've got to show how you can solve problems. Um, and one of the most persuasive tools in being able to communicate that uh is is storytelling and if you can use your photography in storytelling to to demonstrate how you approach problems and solve those problems that's that that's a clear winner for me uh, the the standard portfolio is just not something that really takes my fancy because anyone can have someone else generate that it doesn't show me uh how someone's made an approach to something but the story of how they had solved the problem that's that's the important part for me thanks for that perspective nishan um yes. oh go ahead colin no i was just thank you for, for oh. the response thank you okay cool um i'll throw my opinion in i have given this before and take it with a grain of salt but i think one key uh thing that employers are looking for is to show that you can do the work. That's what people are looking for. Show you know how to do the work. Show that you can illustrate your process. You understand what to do when. You can articulate why you made the decisions that you did, the approaches that you did, and you've done the work. And I'm not saying that has to be a necessarily a previous job. It could be, you know, an internship or, you know, volunteering for a nonprofit or, you know, whatever that might be, but employers want to know that you can do the work. Education is great and it's nice. And maybe that's a bar to that. They, a threshold that they ask people to meet, but ultimately an employer wants to know that you will be able to do the work. So think about how you can show that through what you have and what you probably, or maybe need to strive to still illustrate in your portfolio. That that's my two cents. I, I would build off of that and say, so my previous job, the first line, the first thing that the my my former VP said in the interview was, I don't quote, I don't give a shit about your portfolio. That was the first thing he said. <laughs> he didn't want me talking about it. He was just like, it's basically it's being teachable. And I would say that is important for pretty much anything. It's willingness to learn and willingness to do the work, because my previous company I did not know anything about what I ended up doing and I told them that but I it was post covid I had just gotten my masters and I was living with my parents and I was like please hire me I will learn anything you need me to learn I will learn anything <laughs> and they did and they took a chance on me and they took it took me about 3 or 4 months and I became the person that everyone came to for that because if you're able to do that now burnout which is why my question earlier was about burnout in the chat um <laughs> But I would say, be enthusiastic, pull on your life experiences. Every single person has experience of some kind with UX because you've experienced something. You've been on the receiving end, you've been on the giving end. Everything is an experience. Pull on that, pull on what made you passionate about user experience, what made you want to get into it and show that what experience you do have with anything is applicable and is what makes you teachable. Because I think that that is like, I've seen a lot of questions about, I don't come from a UX background. I would say that 90% of the professionals that I've worked with personally did not come from UX background. They don't have a PhD or a master's in HCI or user experience. They have certifications from Google and Nielsen Norman, and they were a teacher. They were a school teacher for 10 years or whatever, because it's all connected. And it's just people trying to make the world a better place for other people. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, perspective, Kimmy. Did you have a question, Kimmy, or did you just want to, you don't? Oh, or you do. Okay. Nope. Hang on. Boop. Okay. There she goes. Uh, all right. Mike, 
Christoph, I see. Yeah, you. Uh, um, two twofold. Um, it's still portfolio related, but to to Colin's point, I am also a photographer, and I'm in the process of writing another article about how photography, the principles of photography that we use, because we're very detail oriented. We see de we see things in different perspectives than other people do. So as a UX designer or a researcher, those kind of um, ideas can be brought forward into a new um, experience. You know, just use those terminologies and you know tell your story through photography and also through um, writing, like Don Norman said, through literature. You know, tell the story of who you are and how to, how that expresses. Um, my second part is I'm. Somebody told me I'm on week eleven of on the market, but how do you translate an old portfolio into a case study version portfolio when you don't have access or knowledge of the problem at hand? Because I have a portfolio that's all super pretty, but it doesn't have any thought behind it. So how would I go about addressing that issue if anybody has ideas? I don't mean I, to derail Colin's question, but it was sort of related to <laughs> No, 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 Michael. Adam, I was just going to say, Michael. I think that you know it's it's tricky, right? Because if you're trying to frame what you're doing into you know frame it in terms of relevance and current, I think I'm more interested in thinking. So you know, if it comes, if if you're applying for a role, it's not just the currency of a case study. It's the the approach that you have in terms of thinking and and how you would do and structure something. So I would focus less on the some of those potential you know, outputs and focus more on how, how you've gone through that journey, how you went through the different steps, the critical thinking bits, the way that you facilitated you know, research potentially, or the way that you've constructed to get insights that have led to design decisions, that those sorts of things, that sort of process is really interesting. And I think that pivots you away then from having a conversation about a particular project that's two years old versus um, you know, something that because you, you're going for a job right now, right? So that way you don't necessarily need to have that conversation. The employer is more interested in you and your thinking and how you've got to that point. That's okay. that's my point of view. Yeah. Thank you. I, I've got two case studies along that line of that, my thought process and my thinking and how I came about, but then it's that old portfolio. Do I even address it or do I just keep moving forward with what I have? Use it organically, you know, as you as you have a conversation with someone, as you're having an interview, if there's a if there's a reason to fall back on one of those because you've had that experience in a particular industry or you know, a particular niche, then then use it. Or if there's been a particularly difficult, you know, someone says you've had difficulty working with stakeholders, which seems to be the standard question. Tell me how you handle difficult stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there might be examples that you've got from previous projects that you can draw on. Your, your experience is valuable. Okay. So I wouldn't put a timeline on it. Thank you. All right, great. Love that. Uh, thanks for that, Mike. Thanks for that question. Thank um, Alexandra, hopefully you can unmute. We will see. Ah. All right, I was like finishing up a question that I had for Adam in regard to what he had just said. But um, <laughs> my question is, I'm sort of curious if there's, Anyone that's come from, well, I'm just a little preface. I am, I just finished up a certificate program through um, a university here in Dallas. And so I'm transitioning like into the professional career world later in life. I kind of did things a little backwards, um, not intentionally, but, um, you know, life circumstances and motherhood um and family needed um to take precedence and so I have you know dedicated the last many years to that and now it's time for career and I'm very excited um but with that being said it's the imposter syndrome and the nerves of being older and not having, um, you know, the experience that a lot of people my age have. You know um, what I'll say to that? You got yeah, experience that younger yeah. people don't I have. Know, Girl, I know. you've got it's... a wealth of experience and knowledge and wisdom that, <clears throat> you know, 
UX can be taught, but some soft skills, they take a little bit more and you're already yeah. up the ladder on a lot of that well, stuff. And that's my question is, cause that's what my um, instructors really were, have pushed me is like, Alex, you have these experiences in life that like you need to leverage these skills. Like they're very applicable, but how, my question is like how, and maybe someone that's more in the kind of like hiring role maybe can explain this or even if someone's been in the same position, but how, how do we, how do I leverage those skills in a way that like, how do I speak to them and how do I present myself in a way that's mm-hmm. professional, but also human, you know, where's mm-hmm. the line of, I think that's what I'm struggling with is sort of that sure. stay Anybody? professional, but also be a real human because my experiences are, you know, valuable and yeah. apply to UX. I, I would just chime in that whatever company that you're looking at, they have customers and some of their customers are going to have the same experiences you have. So you'll be able to relate to them maybe in ways that the people who went through a formal education first can't. So you ha- and, and having those different perspectives is super valuable for companies because you each will be able to pick up something different, you know, and so on a team, having that cognitive diversity is super helpful. So you'll bring something to the table, maybe that other candidates don't. So yeah. how, how do you bring that up in an interview? I don't know, but I mean, just to know that maybe you don't bring it up, but, but if you're, if you're asked about that, you definitely would have a perspective that maybe others wouldn't, and that would be valuable. Thank you. I just wanted to piggyback on what Rob said, because I had a, I had a similar, I mean, I'm older, so I, I can definitely relate to what you're saying. And I, I kind of did a little bit of a career switch, but I won't go into that detail, but I do remember interviewing with someone uh, and talking about this with the hiring person. And they said that uh, similar to what Jen said, that, um, you know, they can't teach like the soft skills, the life experiences. Yeah. They can teach the 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 technical knowledge or the how to do journey maps and all that stuff. But the soft soft skills are things that you that can't be taught. And what what really made the connection to me was how important it is for a lot of these companies and within this field for people to have insights you know, strategy, maturity goes a long way in this field, honestly. I mean, and then depending on the job, I mean, for example, if you, if you're looking at a position that's dealing with like grocery stores or children, it sounds like you're a parent, right? Uh, yeah, I'm a parent, but I, there, there's a lot more to it. I'm a special needs parent. And well, that's so huge. dealt with a lot of yeah, different, that's a good, that's and that a good is, point. That is huge. Different those stuff. Are, yeah, those are huge points of contact. That's you have huge insight into the those those issues. You know, um, those experiences, accessibility, yeah. all that. I mean, um, kids. I mean, all of that. So that I, I don't. Sh- it, it's hard. I get it. But you'd yeah. be amazed at, at the reservoir you have just by yeah. your experience. Absolutely. Hey, Alex. I mean, I, I, I just helped my wife. She just graduated from motherhood. I mean, you never graduate from motherhood, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> we're, we're an empty nester. And she, has, she, went to, she went to college and she stopped when she got married. This is our second marriage. So she's done with parent. She's done with raising kids because everybody's now adults. Right. And she had her her first job interview and she really wanted this job because it's working with people with sorry special Speak of parenting <laughs> right graduate let me mute myself they've all just barged in <laughs> but it's it, all i'm saying is that she was so worried that it's like how am i going to get this job i don't have a resume i don't have anything the only thing i have are the life skills of, of being a mom and i said you've got a lot of transferable skills you have a lot of things that are relatable to the job and so just to shorten this, you know, we helped her, I helped her write her resume that was, okay, you managed multiple schedules with people with kids that had social needs and kids who didn't. So balancing different needs and stuff like that. So yeah. we, I was able to help her understand that, the, you know, you could write and you can tell your story to the employers like this is who I am I don't have that experience but I'm learnable and teachable and she got the job over somebody who has experience so 
Yeah, I think take some time with yourself, Alexandra, and really focus on that. Think about, yeah. like, sit down and, and write down some of those skills that you yeah. have and share it with others and have them add to it because people can, like, you know, Mike, like Mike was saying with his wife, you know, the perspective that he added, like, hey, you're missing this and this and this. And I think there's going to be a lot more there that, than you you take credit for because you take it for granted You're like ah everybody does this no everybody does not do that well so. I think some of it is just like the societal like you know society and thankfully it's sort of I feel like motherhood is and or just stay-at-home parenting <clears throat> in, in general whether it's motherhood or father whatever is becoming more um I guess less like oh that's all you do you know, like no. that question is the worst. It's like, <laughs> and that's coming from people who <laughs> haven't been yeah, here. Yeah, they like, have no idea. No idea. <laughs> yeah, so take that with a grain of salt, <laughs> Alexandra. But, I, but yeah. it's um, it's yeah, yeah. There's a link there. I'm. I, oh, sorry, Jen. I was just pointing out. There's a link yeah. there. That's very interesting. The Mom Project. Yes. Yeah. I, it's. It's just. I don't know. It's a weird transitional time in in my life and I'm excited but I'm also kind of looking back at, at my 20s which are behind me and I'm just like well how do I you know some of this stuff there's time where I'm like well how do I explain and granted it's like oh well you're like a multiple brain surgery survivor and like all these things but like I don't want like wanna, I said sit I down don't wanna, think about it to, yeah. get over the imposter crap yeah. get over it yeah. sit down and think about this list you start it you share it with your boardroom and oh yes bob i'm asking you to unmute got to unmute i'm sorry about the zoom stuff <laughs> i don't know okay coming off there we are yeah hey uh alexandra i think that you're i can feel your pain yeah <laughs> um uh, I think a lot of us have been in situations where we feel inadequate or feel uh, uncomfortable because we're we're not kind of we don't fit in in one yeah. way or another in this kind of traditional way, um, and I I think that um, I think the point that uh, uh, Jen made about listing your skills and and reconceptualizing them as skills is, a, is important. But at the same time, uh, and this, this was kind of the direction that I think Michael was going in, you need to, to superimpose those skills mm -hmm. on what the jobs are. Because uh, people aren't going to kind of automatically say, oh right. yeah, you're, you have soft skills or you have, you're, uh, you're mature or you, know, you have a child with special needs. It's it's going to be how is it that I think about first of all the skills that I bring because of that experience, and then how do those skills map on to what it is a particular employer needs? And it may be different from one industry to another industry or one position to another position. You'll need to kind of be doing that mapping. That'll be really important as far as because they want to they they don't just want to know you have these experiences, mm -hmm. but how is it that they're going to the experiences are going to fit in to what you're going to be asked to do? That's that's yeah, no, that that totally makes a lot of sense. I mean, everything that everyone said has made sense. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Sincerely. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Here's an update about your. Your progression i'd like yes to... please do yes join the slack channel and tell us how it's going <laughs> i Share will your list sure. with us we would be uh, happy to help you flesh it I out i literally not put my resume or my portfolio onto my linkedin yet because i don't even know why i'm like i do just it. do it I do, just it. do it do it <laughs> i'm like my family's relying on me like if i fail it's just you're terrifying. not gonna fail and it i know may I take won't. a little longer than you think but <laughs> yeah. you will not fail you will get there you got well, you got perseverance start. is one thing that i do have on my side there you go well, don, you don mentioned <laughs> failure in the conversation that we learn from yeah. the tip, right that's true so yeah if you do make a mistake you're gonna learn from it and yeah failure motivates me so that's one good thing
I, I'll awesome. do it. Okay. You guys have, you guys have, I'll do it. I'll do it. Great. Awesome. I, well, I also, um, I'm, oh. Oh, I'm going to let um, Haley wrap us up tonight because it's getting kind of late and I'm hungry. I want some dinner. So uh, I'm being very selfish. We could, you know, we could stay on here all night and would be like, you know, whatever six in the morning is your time. Think about how long that could be. Adam, I know that'd be like a really long time. So let's let Haley wrap us up with her final question. I'm so sorry. I just had a quick response to Alexandra. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will sorry make it about quick. That. I, I, you, you're a mother and I would just recommend leaning into your instincts and your intuition because you already have that. It's so innate in you and the way that you can listen to a small sound in the other room and you know exactly what's happening, or you can see an expression or your child's face and you know exactly what they need or what they might be thinking like those are deep 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 rooted instincts in, within you and I just want to encourage you and everyone on this call that this speaks to listen to your gut like that's just real like we we tend to let that anxiety and that imposter syndrome kind of stomp that out of us but like, like trust yourself you know trust what 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 information do you need to tell this person to sell your story. You know, what information do they, like jump into their shoes, use that empathy to, you know, walk a mile in their shoes and understand like when I'm selling something to my boss, I'm like, what, what questions do I anticipate my boss to have for me whenever I challenge this problem or whenever I present this case, you, you know, this case that I think we need to go and do. And I'm going to, you know, try to be as prepared as I can because I already know my boss and I know what I think is going to come and, and whatever I don't know, I'm, I know I can handle it because I know this problem well, I've thought about it well, um, I have that empathy and that compassion and I'm just going to let that drive my decision. So your imposter syndrome, just, just quiet those demons. Cause you got it. You, <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you didn't have it. You've done so many more wonderful, difficult things than what you're doing now. So just remember that. I'm going to be a little snarky and say, I can't wait, Alexandra, until you come to me and I go, I told you so. I can't wait. You got to give me that because it's going to happen. <laughs> I think, I think we're local too. I mean, I think we're, I, I yeah. think, so I, I know that we, I know that we have some of the same, um, yeah. cross paths with them. The Hit same. me up, yeah. come chat. I'm happy to chat anytime. Um, I'm going to call it an evening because again, it's late. Thank you so much for folks sticking on for this happy hour. We will have another happy hour in May. So bring, see you later, Rob. Uh, thank you and come to the next happy hour if we didn't get to your question. Apologies and um, we'll see you soon. Have a good day. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. 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 Bye.